I would like to know why this is not an example of the new atheists avoiding the strongest possible arguments from the opposition. I was feeling kind of disappointed with the new atheists at that point, thinking you're not really delivering what you said you'd deliver, and my my allegiances were gradually shifting, I think, towards the Christian worldview. Hello and welcome to this week's video from Unbelievable, a really special one for you today. I'm going to be introducing you to a friend and colleague of mine, Peter Byram. But if you want more from the show, do check out the links with today's video and make sure to like and subscribe. That way you can find out more from Unbelievable on a regular basis. Peter, welcome along to the show. It's it's great to have you on. Uh, we, we go back quite a way, don't we? When did we first bump into each other? Can you remember? I think oh, potentially we're going back to about 2002. 10 we've known each other a decade yeah. how does that make you feel at least over a decade yeah. yeah and and really we first bumped into each other because you started listening to unbelievable um and at the time you were not a christian um now fast forward 11 12 years uh we're working together every single day because you are my assistant uh an amazing sort of producer come assistant come as administrator for all things unbelievable um, and it's been an interesting journey to, that's brought you uh, to this point. And, and I couldn't do what we're doing now with the show without you, PB. But um, let's start back at the beginning. Um, uh, how, how, how did you end up listening to Unbelievable? What, mm. what was the journey that brought you to that point? Well, I think, um, well, specifically, I, the very first time I discovered your show was being linked through from William Lane Craig's website, um, because that was when you interviewed him and I, you know, um, heard you interviewing him, heard the theme music. And then from that point, I discovered more of the stuff that you were doing and then just sort of obsessively started listening to it on the podcast. Um, but of course, the whole reason why I was on William Lane Craig's website in the first place um, was because I think this was near the end of my time at university. And despite having a Christian background, by the time that I'd gone through gap year in university, I'd given it up completely. I'd thrown it in the bin and just decided I don't, I don't believe this anymore. And that was um, partly just because, you know, my own, what you might call a faith upbringing didn't survive my leaving my parents and going, doing my own sort of independent thing. Um, but also because um, I had been influenced by and um, had my opinions changed at university, partly through the company I was keeping, but also through being introduced to the, at the time it was new, because uh, we're talking about 2007, the, the new atheists, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens. So I had been set on um, a big um, journey uh, from that point, actually, of being challenged to consider atheism as a genuine alternative. Um, and it was from that that I was gradually discovering people like William Lane Craig and John Lennox and Christian apologists but it was through people like Dawkins they were the ones that triggered that off tell, tell me then so you, you grew up in a Christian household and you had a Christian faith I think you know but by the time you got to university you were starting to question a lot of things so so were there specific people you were hanging out with who were kind of skeptical what what were some of the influences going on yeah. as, you, as you entered that particular phase I think it's very much a cultural thing it's probably quite a standard story for a lot of people where when they go out on their own leave their parents authority and they go wow I can do all this stuff now hang out with you know my contemporaries um, you do start to absorb and get immersed in the culture around you. Now, I had done uh, drama and theatre um, at university. That was my um, uh, that was a four year course, and I'd done uh, the year out drama company in Stratford up on Avon, which is amazing, by the way. If people are looking for something for um, any of their offspring that are so inclined um, for a mm. gap year, but um, so I, I had been immersed in a very kind of um, creative, expressive, experimental. Um, you could say liberal, I suppose, um, world. And I do think in the arts world, not totally and exclusively, but there is there, there is more of a sense of um, being more daring and experimenting, pushing boundaries, um, you know, embracing grey areas. And, and partly it's, it's just the student life as well. Um, mm. The people mm. I was hanging out with and I was finding it attractive myself it was easy just to say, oh, well, we've got the sophisticated view of things. We're embracing the animal nature of humanity and all that kind of stuff, plus necking pints at the pub. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and it's easy just to see religious people as a bunch of people who can't handle the grey areas of life. It's just black and white. 
Um, and mm. oh yeah, they're a bunch of idiots that don't believe in evolution. Uh, you know, all, all the usual stereotypes, really. But at the time, that's just where I was, and that's just the way the world seemed. Um, and I was just dropping what you might call the yeah. religious stuff, and yeah, living differently. And to that extent, you know, how much did the new atheist authors, Dawkins, Harris, Hitchens and co kind of have a part to play in what you were coming across reading, watching at the time? Well, it was fascinating because, um, you see, this was about halfway through university. One of my very best friends who was not a Christian, he wasn't religious at all. He became a Christian. And that was massively Mm. inconvenient, very inconvenient, because I'd just about (laughs) forgotten the stuff and left it behind. And then one of my best friends that I end up living with at university becomes this born again Christian and all of this stuff is in my face. Um, So that was making me think about it and maybe feeling a bit uncomfortable and wanting to push back a little bit, saying I don't want to get back into this stuff again, thanks. But then Mm. another one of my best friends who was Christian became atheist and it was because of Mm. The God Delusion. I remember vividly him saying, you have to read this book by Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, it's amazing. So I had two... Um, prompts that just destroyed any hope I had of being apathetic at that time. You know, one was seeing somebody become what you might call born again. And the other one was a Christian saying, not only have I also drifted out of it, I have actively embraced atheism. And and I'm not just sort of, um, I've not just sort of let Christianity go. I've embraced the alternative of saying belief in God is false, is wrong. Here is Richard Dawkins and here's his argument. So it was almost like I was being put in a position of needing to choose a view rather than just being able to just sort of sleepwalk through it. Um, But it was very much being exposed to the God delusion and then watching Richard Dawkins. You can blame YouTube for a lot of this as well, um, because, of course, that's where you see all the videos of the debates and the interviews and so forth. And then it's a it's a domino effect. You know, you discover one, you discover the next. You discover Dawkins, I discover Hitchens, discover Sam Harris, and then gradually start discovering other people through it. Um, But the influence of Dawkins was very profound. I think one of the things Mm. that really sticks in my mind from reading it the first time round, he defined faith as meaning believing something without any evidence or in the or against the evidence. Um, Mm. You know, you need to you should only believe things where there's good evidence if you believe it without evidence that's faith and i can remember thinking a couple of things first of all it made sense of why people at our university the lecturers were banging on about um not doing plagiarism and citing your sources because that's a way of giving evidence um but yeah. on a, but on the more profound point um i just it seemed obvious and i just thought well of course that's the way i should live you know you yeah. know and that felt like there was some freedom being opened up there because it meant that anything i didn't like or disagreed with it was as if i could challenge it and say well show me the evidence and i won't go along with it yeah. and then thinking as yeah. well well did i just during this time that i sort of believed this stuff was that all just not based on evidence so i bought his line he said you need evidence don't bother with it if there's no evidence and that's what i went looking for that is what you went looking for and and happily found evidence possibly inconvenient evidence as <laughs> inconvenient well truth, um, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah so so uh, you've already mentioned that william lane craig was a significant part of of this so tell us about how you bumped into his work his apologetics and and how that made you start to rethink and revisit the whole question of christianity well that was part of the chain reaction of what happens when you're a student and you're putting off doing your essays and you're browsing youtube <laughs> you know you start with dawkins um and i was watching people that dawkins would be in interacting or debating with and discussing with and I was watching Christians doing really badly Dawkins would be laying into them and Hitchens would be ripping them apart and I'd be cheering them on saying yes go for it show this you know moron that he's talking (laughs) nonsense or whatever that's it's kind of how I was thinking of it at the time but then but then I saw his debate with John Lennox and that was you know there was much more nuance in that one um and then gradually discovered William Lane Craig um and that was just that was just through YouTube. And um, there was a video of him responding to the central argument in Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, and actually ironically showing that despite the fact that Dawkins kept saying that he's being logical and rational in his argumentation and evidence, he was just calmly picking apart the central argument of The God Delusion, the main argument upon which the whole book is meant to stand, where Dawkins sort of famously says, you know, God almost certainly does not exist. He was just um, showing that it's, you know, the conclusion doesn't even follow logically from the premises of the argument. It's got premises in there that undermine science itself. 
and that Dawkins is fundamentally question begging because he's assuming that the only kind of designer that you could invoke to explain the universe would have to be one that is also composed of lots and lots of bits of complex material pieces like the universe is. And when you think about that, that is just question begging. Because mm. if um, if that's the only kind of designer that could design the universe, then then that would mean that atheistic materialism or naturalism would already have to be true. And he's not done anything anything to address the immaterial, transcendent, divine yeah. mind and that kind of stuff. So it was it was inconvenient, but also very intriguing. It was interesting seeing mm. here is a Christian, um, you know, a Christian philosopher, and he is using logic, reason, and evidence. Um, in a way that seemed even more transparent uh, than the new atheists were. And then just one thing leads to another. I just start exploring yeah. his work in greater and greater depth. And, and at this point, did, as that sort of threw up questions for you over your up to that point sort of embrace of atheism, um, did, did you start to think of yourself differently? Did you think, OK, well, maybe I'm more agnostic about this whole thing at this point? I think I sh did gradually shift into what you might call agnosticism. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the friends that I would lived with at university would always say I was the one that put the cat among the pigeons because I would make life even more awkward by asking them the awkward questions in the middle. Um, but no, I think I, I certainly did see that it wasn't as nuanced um, or, mm. well, not so much. It, it wasn't as straightforward as the new atheists were making out. They seem to have a lot of valid complaints still, and I had no interest in getting pulled back into any kind of organized religion. But as a kind of intellectual pursuit, it it, it was very, um, I don't know if it's addictive or not, but I, I just kind of felt, I, I almost yeah. felt like, well, if what Dawkins had, did say in The God Delusion is the case, that you've got to look for the evidence, then I thought, all right, well, it looks like there's some evidence for Christianity here, so I better stick with it, and I better really try and see how strong it is, you know, because I still wanted Christianity to be false, it's just that, right. so I've got to hopefully find that the evidence doesn't stack up for it. Um, so <laughs> I think there was that. But also, you know, just because you might find something intellectually interesting or even persuasive, it doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of you is going to go along with it. Because I had all mm. sorts of other emotional, personal reasons for not wanting to get dragged back into that or certain ways that my lifestyle was and the way I was going. So I think the interesting thing is that, you know... Um, I think that stuff was very influential and very important. If I didn't have the apologetics uh, and the, the good evidences for Christianity available and being presented, then it would have been easier for me to avoid it and hide away um, and mm. use excuses to not um, give Christianity a, a good chance. Um, yeah. But there was more going on than just the intellectual stuff. I was still hanging out for a bit to keep it at arm's length still. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I remember one significant debate event. I think it was at Wellington College mm. and uh, Dawkins was on stage with a number of other atheist and Christian contributors doing a sort of roundtable IQ squared debate. And I was there in the audience sort of reporting on it for Unbelievable at the time. And uh, during the Q&A time uh, in the, you know, there must have been at least a thousand people present, probably in, in a large auditorium. One young man got up and challenged Richard Dawkins on the microphone to respond to one of his most cogent, you know, uh, critics, William Lane Craig. And it turned out that young man was you. Um, and I actually featured that on my Unbelievable show. I was so impressed by this this young guy who stood up and, and, and sort of challenged Dawkins. Um, uh, and you that was your first appearance on the Unbelievable show before we ever knew each other. Yeah. But um, what, what, yeah, do you remember that? Do you oh, remember yeah. what happened and what inspired you? I remember you it very to, well, to, to yeah. That? That's right. Cause, you see, I, I'd, I'd, I was aware for a while that there was this thing going around the internet of why wouldn't, well, what about if Dawkins and William Lane Craig had a debate? That would be really good. You know, because, you know, you know, you've got the foremost atheist, you know, in the world. And then you've got what appears to be, you know, the most rigorous um, or, you know, sort of foremost defender of Christianity there. It, it makes too much sense that surely they, they ought to have a debate or a dialogue. Um, and indeed, you know, it, it made 
the most sense because actually Dawkins has interacted the most with the classic arguments for God's existence in The God Delusion. He actually goes through some of them. And these are arguments that Bill Craig has been defending, you know, long before Dawkins arrived. You, you know, this goes back to, I think, the 1970s or 80s that William Lane Craig mm. was working on the cosmological argument. So um, it was making sense to me. And it seemed very odd why Dawkins wasn't doing it. And there were these stories about Dawkins had you know, replied in 2007 and said, no, you know, that might look good on your CV and not on mine and being a bit dismissive. But the interesting thing is um, at that event, I almost didn't ask the question because I was a bit worried about, well, maybe it's not very relevant to the topic. The topic was, is new atheism the new fundamentalism? And I almost felt like it would be a bit inappropriate to ask the question. But then Richard Harry stood up in the opening speeches and said, what, uh, one of the characteristics of fundamentalism is it always targets the weakest um, arguments and opponents from the opposition and avoids the strongest ones. And I thought, thanks, Lord Harry's. I, that's my reason. That's why I need to ask this question, because it looks like at least it looks like that might be what's going on here. Maybe it isn't, but it would be good to find out. So, yeah, I just thought, well, now or never. Professor Dawkins, you are arguably the world's leading apologist for atheism and you have been invited on several occasions by arguably the world's leading Christian academic apologist Dr. William Lane Craig to engage in debate. I would like to know why this is not an example of the new atheist doing what Lord Harry's has described as avoiding the strongest possible arguments from the opposition. Okay, thank, uh, you. thank you. That's a very straight question. Over here now. I have always said when invited to do debates that I will be happy to debate a bishop, a cardinal, a pope, an archbishop, indeed I have done both, um, but that I don't take on creationists and I don't take on people whose only claim to fame is that they are professional debaters. They've got to have something more than that. I'm busy. He gave his answer with a number of excuses in there. Um, you know, sort of um, some things about only debating bishops and stuff, which He's debated non-bishops. Um, he doesn't. He says he didn't debate creationists. William Lane Craig is not a creationist. He, he affirms, you know, that the universe is billions of years old. You know, he uses the Big Bang in the Kalam argument. And then, of course, most famously, he said, I'm busy. Well... <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, anyway, that was the first encounter I had with you. Um, and then, of course, we started to communicate because you started to actually pop up on the unbelievable discussion group as it was at that time. Uh, I seem to remember your um, your avatar was a swan. Um, yeah. Tell us about your obsession with swans. Oh, they Peter. were just my favourite wild animals at the time. And I think I, I think still <laughs> are. Yeah, um, I just think they're, they're amazing <laughs> creatures. They're, they're fascinating. Um you know, it's a, well, it, it's the blend of um, you know um, elegance, but also maybe a bit of the danger there as well. You know that they're yes. uh, um, no, I just think they're great. The yeah, well, anyway, this person with a swan as an avatar was frequently popping up in my timeline and was just a, a fascinating character. And uh, I think I eventually linked it with the person who had asked that question at the event. Mm. But um, because they were sort of agnostic, but asking really interesting searching questions about Christianity and, and sort of often critiquing the atheists mm. on the site as well. Um, so I, that was, you know, and then eventually you even came on the show at one mm. point um, once we'd gotten to know each other a bit online. Mm. Um, I think it was to do a discussion on original sin. Yeah. Any memories from that and, and where you were in your journey at that? Yeah, point? well, I, I think I was almost on the edge of becoming a Christian, but that issue was hanging me up a bit. I was I was finding it a bit hard to compute, you know, the idea of... Um, uh, you know, I mean, it all seems to go back to this idea of original sin and that some fundamental thing happened of some kind, which meant that the, for want of a better term, the default factory setting almost of humanity was that we are going to sin and we would and that's the way that all of us would be. And I just found that a bit, you know, I'm trying to find it a bit hard to get my head around it. And so that was a good opportunity. Yeah, just to come on your show and, you know, um, yeah, just sort of probe the issue a bit more. Um, I can remember coming away from that thinking I probably hadn't prepared for it very well and I probably should have been more antagonistic, really. I mean, I, I, ironically, now that I am a Christian and that I've read into the stuff more, I probably could have a better go at, you know, challenging the stuff and, you know, picking it apart. Um, you know, but that's what you're meant to do. You keep learning and you keep looking into stuff. But yeah, no, that was that was great. Yeah. It was great to meet you and, yeah. and come in and get drawn more into that world. And I think you're you're right and as well in saying that I was... Yeah, I, I was feeling kind of disappointed with the new atheists at that point, thinking you're not really delivering what you said you'd deliver. And my 
my allegiances were gradually shifting, I think, towards the mm. Christian worldview. Mm. Mm. I, I remember 2011 being a very significant year. And that was, of course, the year when we hosted William Lane Craig um, on a number of debates and speaking events around the UK. I was part of a small team bringing him over. And uh, and even th though at that time you would not have called yourself a Christian, you, you became quite involved just as a volunteer mm. uh, with that tour. Um, you were present at a number of the debates. You were helping with some of the publicity around it. You were among the small ragtag band who were trying to raise PR and profile around the fact that Dawkins continued to refuse to debate yeah. Craig. And we even had a, I'm sure you remember well, that Oxford bus campaign, yeah. which was mimicking the atheist bus campaign. Yeah. But this time saying there's probably no Dawkins, but find out yeah. by coming to the Sheldonian Theatre. Yeah. It was all a lot of fun, actually. Yes. Um, uh, do, any, any kind of significant memories of, of that particular tour and the, the effect it had on you overall? Well, it was really interesting. I think at that time, you see, my I was probably ready intellectually or mind wise I was probably ready to become a Christian about a year before I actually became one um, because I'd made all sorts of really stupid lifestyle choices near the end of university as well I hadn't I wasn't planning properly what I was doing I'd I sort of embraced a, a, almost a kind of hedonism in a way you know because you know that um, of course the atheist bus campaign of 2009 said there's probably no god stop worrying and enjoy your life well I kind of had taken, not necessarily from their prompting, but I kind of had gone down that route of, oh, this stuff's all too big and confounding and confusing and there's so much pressure going on at university. I think I will just enjoy my life, thanks, you know, and just kind of went a bit crazy with what I was choosing to do in that way. And so I just think that I, I, I had got myself rather embedded in lifestyle choices that weren't compatible with Christianity. I knew I would have to give them up um, and I would have to sort of um, almost stop and start again, really. Um, so I can remember that time being one where my own personal life was very much at a loose end and all sorts of decisions I'd made were kind of falling apart. But but then actually the, the, the conviction of Christianity uh, and all of that was growing um, as well. And there was really that sense of, you know, supporting William Lane Craig, supporting you, um, supporting this stuff, because I really believed in it, was really believing that, you know, it's great to have this tour. Um, it seems like a great bunch of people... Um, doing really good stuff with a lot of integrity, bringing, you know, offering this evidence and engaging with, I think, you know, what turned out to be actually really strong atheist debate opponents. You've got people like Stephen Law and Peter Milliken, for example. And then a lot of the people that had led the charges from the, you know, the, um, you know, the Humanist Association, including people like Dawkins and Grayling and Toynbee, they were all either refusing or dropping out. Um, mm. So I remember that being a really exciting time, a, a lot of drama going on um, of what's yeah. going to happen with the tour. Will Richard Dawkins, you know, accept the invitation <laughs> to finally engage with William Lane Craig? Of course not. Um, but, you know, all that expectation was there. But I can remember really thinking, you know, yes, yeah, something is happening here. Something is changing here. Um, I, but I was very much living one day at a time in terms of what was going on. And when it came to the tour itself, finally, I think there was a kind of moment at which I have a feeling it was a conversation, actually, not with Bill, but with Jan, Bill's wife. Yeah. that was a bit of a turning point for you. That's right. Well, I think I, I think I describe it almost as William Lane Craig and other apologists. But I think William Lane Craig primarily through his work had built me up to this point of being able to, you know, embrace Christianity from, you know, the evidence and, you know, the arguments that he'd mm. given, all of that equipping, he'd kind of brought me to the edge of it. And then I think his wife, Jan, through a little conversation, just gave me that little extra, you know, to sort of that little nudge. extra nudge. It, it was, um, you know, she was just, you know, sort of um, talking to me, had sat down next to me at the first um, debate of the tour and did say, thing is, Pete, you know, um, with becoming a Christian, if you can't give everything to Jesus... If you can't give him everything, don't do it. You'd be better off if you stayed an atheist. Um, and Bill had said a similar thing a bit later on as well. You know, he's seen people that are kind of one foot in and one foot out. And it's and it's just miserable and it doesn't work. It, it, that This mm. needs to be a full commitment. And it's about Christ, you know. And thankfully, you know, there was that evidence for the resurrection and so forth to give that extra clout behind why you could, you know, go through with this. Um but really, it, it was, you know, if you can't give your whole life to Jesus, don't do it. 
and that really gave me a sense of what the decision would have to be. Well, I'm glad to say you did make that decision mm. and we went on to become firm friends. Uh, we worked formally and informally together over the following years. Um, and well, you know, journeys are always a winding one. Um, what, what did you find the following years meant for you as you started to embrace Christianity and mm. what that looked like for your own life and relationships and and where it's taken you obviously up to today. Well it's great actually because I, I can remember actually and um, when I told Bill and Jan that I'd made the decision to become a Christian um, you know of course they were saying oh that's wonderful you know and all that kind of stuff but, but and then of course Jan brilliant brilliant because she leapt straight and said oh Peter we can promise you pain and all sorts of you know <laughs> and, and, Bill, and, and Bill was um there kind of going oh honey maybe don't say that, <laughs> that kind of um, but, um, but but actually she was brilliant to being very forthright saying that you know you can expect some things actually to get worse as well as better um yeah. you know and, and Tim Keller makes a brilliant point that you know um basically you know I think up until the point of becoming a Christian your only enemy was God and that's because you were only because you were regarding him as an enemy but then when you become a Christian um you know you get God on your side and then you get all these other things turn against you um but not just that as well I think so I think what had happened really was I I, I had to just start again you know you know do that really embarrassing thing that so many students have to do where they have to admit that what I've started doing didn't work you go back move in with your parents go back not to square one but you do have to sort of move back in and rebuild you know look at your what you're doing with career and that stuff and confronting mm. all sorts of things about confronting all sorts of things about reconciling with them as well um you know um there were addictions to get over I'd got hooked on smoking as well and that didn't just miraculously vanish um and um, and I think the thing I really learned from that was God deals with people according to what the individual person really needs. And I think I was looking for mm. quick fix, miraculous firework display cures of everything suddenly falling into place, um, you know, and actually that wasn't what I got. And it was good that I didn't get that because actually my own learning needed to go in a different direction. Um, you know, so there was a lot of things that needed confronting. Um, but there is that thing, you know, as well that, you know, you, you become a new creation, you know, you know, all of, you know, all of the sin and the shame of what you've done before that's paid for wiped clean, not on my CV or whatever the analogy is you want to make anymore. Um, you know, you know, Christ has taken that paid for it, given me, you know, his, his righteousness, cleanliness and exchange and set everything up so that, right, you're reconciled to God, but it's only the beginning. I think that the problem is that one of the dangers, I think, sometimes when we go out there and try and evangelize people is we make it sound as if coming to Christ is the end of the journey. You know, you become a Christian, yeah. tick the box, yay, good, next. And that's not the way it yeah. works at all. It's meant to be the beginning. Um, and so that was the start of just trying to grapple with what does this new life look like? Um and almost sort of doing, you know, putting the apologetics slightly to one side or not doing it so intensively and actually getting into theology and discipleship study yeah. as well. Because having been yeah. brought to yeah. this point of believing the Bible is true, I better get on and study it. Um, so there was a real trajectory where I had to confront all sorts of things. There was, um, you know, confronting um, a deep rooted perfectionism that I'd had for a long time, which when I moved on mm -hmm. to London to do freelance um, digital um, production work you know there was anxiety issues acute anxiety issues that were coming through and I ended up seeing a brilliant biblical counsellor for that and that was some of the most challenging and fruitful discipleship um, that I had to go through and that was really you know from there you learn more about and this is this kind of stuff you can see in the work of you know CCEF or Biblical Counselling UK as well where you really get to learn what it means where if you are a Christian and you have your identity in Christ and all of that stuff you learn more about what does that actually mean for me and the struggles that I have and that was learning more about you know um what God is like his grace his sovereignty there's been a lot about sovereignty on the show recently <laughs> um you know about you know God is in control you're not you can't screw you can't screw up God's plans you know no matter how powerful you like to think of yourself as so there's been all of that stuff you know and you know and then all the way through to, you know, um, meeting and marrying my wife, Helen, and being able to move on and raise our family, the whole trajectory and coming to this point of, you know, working with you after this. 
uh, time is is extraordinary yeah. so yeah um no it really is you become a christian it's the start it's not the end and it will um it does give you it, it's it's amazing but part of that is yeah. that it will challenge you and i think i sort of had a bit of an inkling of that which might have been why i resisted it you know for a for a bit but um yeah it's um it's it, it it's it's worth it well i'm i'm gl- i'm glad that god's grace broke through in the way it did but it's never an easy journey Mm. um but it's in some ways i can look back now and we're still on the journey you and i Mm. together peter but see the way that all of those experiences have actually gifted you in ways that are now really coming to the fore in what you're doing alongside me with unbelievable Uh, i personally thank god for your story for your life now with helen and the kids uh and for the way in which it has equipped you to be able to kind of be on this stage of your journey uh, with Unbelievable, um, because it, it, it just means so much to me that, that, that you've got that story, that background that in, equips you to engage with the issues that we're trying to put out in the world. Um, and just lovely to revisit your story again um, on the show today. So God bless you, Peter. Thank you very much for sharing your story. And may I wish you, Helen, and all the kids a very happy Christmas. Thank you very much, Justin, and you too. And I should say as well, likewise, thank you for doing what you're doing and have been doing over all those years because you played a role yourself. Unbelievable played a role, um, you know, and, and you in the way that you host and conduct the shows, you know, being able to go to the Unbelievable Conference as well. Um, you, you, you were a part of that as well. So thank you for doing what you're doing and it's great to be a part of it now. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.